It's time to pull those belts tight, race fans. The Front Stretch is coming at you. Presented by Joe's Karting and Council Bluffs. Now, here's Dan Taylor and Dirk Houston. Well, good morning to you, race fans, and welcome to the Front Stretch, presented by Joe's Karting and Council Bluffs, online at joeskarting.com. Fast pace indoor kart racing. In fact, it's, I believe it's the fastest indoor karting racing in the Midwest. Uh, this is the time of year when that's a beautiful thing, uh, especially with what is set to happen tomorrow and Tuesday and who knows what. I had one of the nurses uh, from my dialysis clinic went for her first time. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it was just Sunday night uh, a week ago. She said, uh, I come to dialysis on Monday, and she goes, hey, I went to that indoor racy thingy place. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, what? And she goes, you know, over by the casinos. And I said, oh, Joe's Karting? Yeah, that's the place. That is really fun. It's so addicting. <laughs> you have no idea. Like, once you get off that cart after you run, you're hooked. I mean, it's it, it's, it's, it's it probably is what I can assume to be as addictive as heroin or cocaine because oh. it's, man, it is, you don't get an adrenaline rush like that for a lot of other things around this area going to sporting. We don't have that kind of fun stuff to be able to experience you have to go on vacation miles and miles away down to kansas city or over to des moines or even even to a bigger city to go to get excitement like that but we've got it right here in, in omaha and council bluffs and i mean she was she was really excited she goes we went with two couples she goes i was first the other girl was second and the guys were third and i just told her i said well the guys are bigger she goes mm-hmm. well, what's that got to do with it i said they weigh more so it's harder for them to get going and she said oh and i said did you ever lift off the gas she said nope i said did you use the brake she said nope and i said start using the brake you'll yep. go fast Exactly. Uh, get down to Joe's Karting. Uh, find it online, Joe's Karting with a K dot com. That's Karting with a K uh, dot com, or just Google them. That's the easiest thing to do. Hey Siri, OK Google. <laughs> I, I use the OK Google because I have an Android, but it, it gets you there easily. Uh, hours, prices, everything's online on their website with a great little website. All right, we got a big show lined up for you today. We don't have much time to kind of uh, flap around, so we got to get to it. Uh, intern number one, we're going to talk a few news and notes around the NASCAR community, and we're going to announce the Daytona 500 party going on at Quaker Steak and Lube. We'll get you more details as far as what's that going to consist of. Turn number two, we will talk with the driver of El Toro Loco, which is one of the Monster Jam trucks that's going to be down in Kansas City this coming weekend. So it's going to be Mark List will join us to talk about what it's like to drive one of those trucks. A lot going on behind the wheel of those trucks. Because this Gallup Parts Legends of the Dirt Series turns three and four will be Jim Wilson. You know Jim's going to be the race director uh, at At Adams Adams County. County. And so we had him come on the show because he was uh, W DRL, he was the race director for that. He was NASCAR Central Region Director for 20 years, the Bush All Star Tour starter upper and and uh, <laughs> founder and runner. I mean, yeah. I mean, he led that series in the WDRL. All the racers love him. Yeah, he's been a big reason why we were able to keep dirt racing going during the 80s and 90s with some of his rule innovations and keeping things formed. So we'll talk to him about that in turns three and four. Uh, so let's get to turn number one. We start off with some ba- sad news and especially sad news for what I do in our community. We lost Barney Hall this week who was a veteran for MRN. Took on the broadcast starting in 1970. He missed only four races in his entire career. He retired after 2014 and uh, passed away earlier this week. And um, Big loss for MRN. But he, had, he just had one of those voices you know it's kind of the paul harvey voice that um dick clark voice that was just it was so easy to listen to well and he was an innovator yeah you know a lot of the stuff where they break them down now by turns and stuff that was all him Mm -hmm. he was fantastic somebody you guys may not know very well but we on the front stretch know him very well doug fritz who was formerly the marketing director for iowa speedway uh picked up a new position this earlier this week as chief marketing director for bk racing so hopefully with knowing doug and the stuff that we can do with the show maybe we can get some stuff with bk racing going yeah get some uh good interviews with the drivers i i do believe didn't that did they not sign david reagan that no David Reagan went to front row racing. Right. Yeah, not, um, not BK. But uh, so that is great news for Doug. He was a, a big help to us getting the front stretch a presence at Iowa Speedway, and it'll be great to be able to work with him again as a part of BK Racing. De Benedetto resigned with BK. That's there you who go. it was. All right, uh, we have tickets to give away, and we're going to do it right now. So we have tickets to give away for the Arena Cross event going on March 5th. at uh, That's Saturday, March 5th at the CenturyLink Center. Now, this is the professional racing. Track party opens up at 5 o'clock. Gates open up at 6 o'clock. Show starts at 7 o'clock. We're going to give away a family four-pack. Dirt, all of you kind of pick out the category. Should we do a dirt question or should we do a NASCAR question? Um, let's go ahead, since we've been doing our Legends of the Dirt all winter, let's do a dirt question. Okay. Well, this is going to be an easy one. Uh, then maybe it's an easy one. I, I'll try to give you as much hint as possible. Can I win? 
Wait, no. <laughs> <laughs> Which driver battled with Donnie Schatz for several laps, eventually winning the 2015 World of Outlaws race at I-80 Speedway? Speaking of a Legends of the Dirt series, that is your hint. So once again, this driver battled with Donnie Schatz for one of the best races I saw all year long. Man, and I can't win. Those last 10 laps, they just went at it hard. I mean, lap after lap, slide jobs, just making it work. And he was able to beat the eventual 2015 World of Outlaw champion, but he was able to beat out Donnie Schatz for the win at I-80 Speedway. Don't get it confused with Crawford County Speedway or Junction. This is for the I-80 Speedway race, and that was the World of Outlaw race. Let me know who it was. Give us a call right now, 402 573 402-573-0590. Those are the numbers to call. First person to call up and let Craig know who was the driver that beat Donnie Schatz for the 2015 World of Outlaw race at I-80 Speedway. Let me know who it was. You're going to win a family four-pack to the Amsoil Motocross arena races at the CenturyLink Center coming up Saturday, March 5th. That's the professional racing day, and we'll have more coming up on those races and in the if next... You, if you've never been to one of these races and watched these guys go over these jumps and get 30 or 40 foot of air, it mm-hmm. is really awesome. I'm excited about it. I'm really excited, and hopefully you can join us too if you know the answer to that trivia question. Alright, let's get on with the show. Let's talk about the Daytona 500 party at Quaker Steak and Lube. Earlier this week, NASCAR finally announced the full 2016 TV schedule, so we now know what time we're going to be at Quaker Steak and Lube. Noon! Green flag waves at noon. We're going to get there at about 11 a.m. to help set up. Our friends over at CD 105.9, Steve King's going to join us out there too. We're going to have tons of prizes between CD 105.9, the front stretch here on AM 590, and Quaker Steak and Lube. I know they have a ton. She went, Jamie went and bought an absolute ton of prizes to give away that day. So they're kind of what you want to call knick-knack memorabilia stuff. So there's bumper stickers and there's hats and banners and all sorts of stuff for probably your major top 20 drivers. You know, you've got your Tony Stewart, your Hendrick drivers, Joe Gibbs racing drivers, Kevin Harvick, uh, Kurt Busch, and all those guys. So they've got little knick-knack stuff to give away. We have autographed hero cards and lug nuts Nuts. that we can give away. Um, We have some posters from some of the dirt races at I-80. Yep, we'll give away that stuff. And then CD's got stuff that they're going to be giving away too. So it's going to be a whole big party. And that's going to be your opportunity to really get in. You're kind of your your unofficial final time to get in on the front stretch pickums contest that we announced last weekend. Now, obviously, because of the rules, you can still get into the race up until race number four of the schedule because according to the rules, you can miss four. You can't miss four or more races, four or more picks. So if you happen to join by race number four, which I believe off the top of my head is is Phoenix, Phoenix International Raceway. So if you join by Phoenix. Technically, you can still win the event because all you got to do is just pick enough winning drivers in the remaining, what, 22 races? Start with Harvick's playground. Can- <laughs> <laughs> that's like an instant win. Yeah, so that's that's the way that then you can do that at the uh, Daytona 500 party. So uh, we're going to get there at about 11, get everything set up, kind of start having a good time. Green flag waves at noon, just a little bit after noon. So that's the Daytona 500 party. We really hope you can join us. That's going to be at Quaker Steak in Lube on uh, February 21st, the day of the 20- Daytona 500. That's that's two weeks after the Super Bowl, so mm-hmm. you got plenty of time to recuperate. Exactly. All right, we got to take a break. We'll come back. Turn number two, Mark List, the Monster Jam driver of El Toro Loco, will join us to talk about what it's like to drive one of those trucks. We'll be back here on the front stretch. Joe's Karting and Council of Bluffs has taken a page out of IMCA's rulebook and gone crate. These brand new low emission engines will still have you white knuckling it all through the Metro's fastest indoor facility. Joe's Karting is now friendly for all skill levels with their brand new Honda powered engines. It's time to get to Joe's today and find out what drivers like Jack Dover, Shaylee Bate, and Andrew Kosiski have known for years. Located in Council of Bluffs and online at joeskarting.com. That's karting with a K. This is Andrew from Kaziski Auto Parts. Kaziski Auto Parts is an insurance quality used parts supplier that can match your foreign or domestic car or truck needs. If you have a damaged or broke down car or truck, we guarantee a clean and quality part in next day fashion. Kaziski Auto Parts, your neighborhood premium recycled parts supplier. Call any Kaziski Auto Parts salesman today by dialing 402-731-4592 or visit us at 5040 I Street in Omaha. Kaziski Auto Parts, our quality used parts will match your car or truck's needs. 
We're hooked up in turn two and still showing the green flag on the front stretch. Welcome back to the front stretch, heading into turn number two, and it's time to change pace a little bit. Dirk, uh, we usually talk circle track or dragsters, uh, racing kind of stuff, local Midwest NASCAR driving, but a couple of weeks ago, I went out to the Mid-America Center for the Monster Jam show. I got some tickets through the radio station, and I got to tell you, I didn't expect to have a great time. I expected to have a good time, but not a great time, but man, I was blown away. It was absolutely a fantastic time, so I sat there the whole night going, I got to get one of these guys on the show. So that was your first time for Monsters? Very first time for the Monster Jams, and I was, I, I can't even sell it enough. I was completely blown away at how much fun it was, how exciting it was, the interaction with the announcers and the drivers and the fans, and the way things moved. And how noisy it was. Oh, man. <laughs> it, being in a, in a NASCAR track, it's close, but both of my eardrums were tickling because it was just right there at that at that dangerous decibels. But So we did a little bit of research. We did a little poking around, and we managed to secure the driver of El Toro Loco. Mark List joins us this morning on the front stretch. How you doing, Mark? Good. How are you, Dan? Oh, I am doing fantastic. Uh, appreciate you taking the time out of your night to or out of your day to talk to us a little bit about your career and and driving El Toro Loco. Uh, first off, where did that name come from? Was that you, or was that the previous truck owner? Uh, that that was the previous truck owner. This truck was introduced in Lafayette, Louisiana. That was the first time El Toro Loco came out there. Uh, it's one of the oldest trucks that we have in, in the show. So to me, it's an honor to be a rookie guy here in uh, 2016 uh, competing with this phenomenal El Toro Loco, which is, explains pretty much the way I am. <laughs> You're one crazy bull. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like adrenaline. I like to push myself to the limit and uh, pretty much fearless. So I love doing what I'm doing. It's it's a, it's a dream that came true for me. Yeah, and and what was really kind of cool was a couple of you guys actually don't just stick with a cool paint scheme. You actually put uh, attachments onto the truck. So being El Toro Loco or the Crazy Bull, you've got giant horns coming out of the front of the truck. Yeah, I got the giant horns, and also uh, I got a snorter button that just blows some <laughs> smoke out of the nostrils of the El Toro, you know. So uh, those are two special effects out of El Toro, and I can give some pretty cool effects when I'm doing wheelies and donuts and uh, the freestyle rounds, you know. You guys got enough of uh, buttons and switches and, and things to turn in that truck. How do you manage to hit that smoke button? Well, it's, it's a lot is keeping your mind, you know, focused on what you're doing and uh, – Keep your finger close to that button, so once you're in the air, just click it and get back on it. Let's talk about the uh, start of your racing career. It feels like you kind of got all this adrenaline rush from your mom. Apparently, she was the first female rally car driver in your home country of Costa Rica. Was she a bit of a badass? Yeah, she is, totally. <laughs> totally. I mean, when we were driving with her, we always she used to drive very fast all the time. Safe, though, you know. So, um, she... She pretty much taught me how to drive since I was at the age of nine. And, uh, well, she was, like like you said, it. she was the first female rally car racer in Costa Rica. And she always has a passion for engines. Uh, so I guess that's where my side, my passion for engines and loud motors, you know, uh, come into my blood. I started pretty much eight years ago here in uh, Monster Jam. Yeah. Um, when I started working for this company, I pretty much started just uh, doing the floor protection for all the fields, you know, in the department of the dirt crew. And uh, then I, be- I started building tracks. I learned how to run heavy equipment, and uh, I started building all the tracks for Monster Jam. Do you, um, think, do you think that building those tracks in your early days kind of gives you a little bit of an advantage now? Oh, totally. Well, I, I'm, I'm always being a person that learns a lot just by lo- watching, you know. So every time I was building a track, I was always thinking and dreaming with the day that I was going to be behind the wheel of a Monster Jam truck. So while I was building a ramp, I was thinking, if I was a driver, how I would like this ramp to be. So, you know, I always, like, push myself to do better ramp and stuff. And then every time I see every show that, we, that I've been doing for so many years, every time I get impressed and I pay so much attention to what the drivers are doing. So I think that's something that's giving me an advantage out of here this season. When I was watching you guys race and, and taking on your event and doing your freestyle stuff, I kind of began to appreciate that, you know, when you look at Monster Jam on the surface, it it feels like a real manly, kind of brutal, tough, beat them up, rough them up kind of a sport. But I, I hate to sound kind of wimpy about this, but there is a gracefulness to what you guys are doing out there with those giant trucks. Oh, for sure. I mean, uh, well, what we're doing is, Things that you will not think is capable to do with one of these machines. 
Uh, they we, they got so many years of uh, you know doing research and studying to get better parts and better and and better engines and better safety equipment for all of our Moss Jam trucks, so we can do what we do. Also, you know, well, we all go through a very uh, in, intense training at the Monster Jam University in, in, in Illinois. Yeah. Uh, and here's where we all get prepared to do what we do. And, well, we get a custom fitted seat. We get all the safety equipment, fireproof suit, helmets, hand devices, all what we need to be able to perform the way we do. Yeah, that Monster Jam University, I was watching some clips on that while I was at the Mid-America Center watching you guys race a couple of weeks ago. Excuse me, uh, watching you guys compete a couple of weeks ago. And I was really impressed. I mean, it, it's kind of like a a, 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 a a training camp in the NFL. It's, I mean, it's some pretty rigorous stuff. you got to be pretty physically fit to be able to manhandle these trucks. Oh, totally. I mean, they, we even get a personal trainer. Uh, so we go, we work out for pretty much three hours every single day. Then we go onto the track and we rehearse uh, all like Ray well, racing ATVs, the Speedsters, the Monster Jam trucks. Because that's another thing. We race in three vehicles, not just the Monster Jam yeah. trucks, you know. So um, we get a lot of training physical and also on the track, you know. So that's uh, what allows all these new rookie drivers that we out here perform almost the same level as the older drivers that we have. And it's given us a good advantage. If you go to see one of our shows now these days, there's nothing you've ever seen before. And you just saw it a couple of weeks ago, like you talk about. Well, it, it really shows when they show those in-truck in, uh, cams, you know, exactly how much abuse as a driver. You're, you're being tossed around in there. I mean, you're getting beat up. you got to come out there with bruises every night. I mean, here and there, yeah, you might get a, a little bruises, but those are minor things. The adrenaline is so high that... You don't even feel none, not nothing. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. It's a passion. It's it's a dream come true. So you just do it. And at the end of the night, yeah, you go to the room. Yeah, I'm a little sore. Next day, you're fine. Yeah. Uh, like I said, the safety equipment that we have, we're pretty much, we can't move nowhere. Once we're in our seats, we cannot turn our heads left or right. The only things they can move are our legs and our hands. So we better hang on tight on that. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to me a little bit about these trucks. Uh, the The numbers are absolutely astounding. It, do I have it right that a Monster Jam truck is about fifteen thousand pounds? It's around from ten to twelve thousand pounds okay. average. How, I mean, uh, seriously, how do you guys get these things to do backflips? And now some of them are doing front flips. You uh, you guys do cartwheels, and I mean, it's <laughs> I am I was absolutely amazed by what you guys were able to do with these giant trucks. Well, a lot of it is because of the amount of horsepower that we have. We have 1,500 horsepower in these wow. Monster Jam trucks. So, you got to have it for uh, those big tires. Right. we got those 66-inch uh, tall tires. Uh, the truck is about 12 feet tall by 12 feet wide, you know, it's, uh, and 20 feet long pretty much. So um, when we are there, it's pretty much we, – we, we like to think like they're big elephants, you know. We're riding big elephants. <laughs> so we, cannot, we cannot really – tell the truck what to do. We got to wait for the truck to pretty much tell us what he wants to do before we can actually get him the throttle to save it when it's about to roll over or stuff like that, you know? The El Toro Loco driver, Mark List, is joining us on the show. You can catch him this weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. There's two shows on Saturday. They're going to be in Kansas City at the Sprint Center. You can get tickets in advance at uh, monsterjam.com slash events, or just Google it. It's usually the easiest way. But uh, I, I was kind of impressed with, you know, I was talking about the horns you got on the front of your truck and, and the smoke that's coming out. Is that kind of stuff that you do to help pump yourself up before your first event? Is get that kind of getting that truck, and you, you got these big old horns, and you got the smoke coming out of the front of the truck and you just kind of get that adrenaline going oh yeah it's, it's also for getting myself and you know show the fans with you know get ready what's about to happen especially what now that we're going to be here in kansas city uh you guys can't miss what's about to happen there nobody can miss this show it's phenomenal it's something new never seen before so you can't miss this show what's the craziest thing you've been able to do so far in el toro loco the first weekend that we were out there, I had a very nice wheelie where I stand completely on the tailgate, let the truck sit there for two or three seconds, and then back it back down. That was something pretty cool. I'm very impressed with it. And, uh, well, the last la last couple of weeks, uh, we were in Nashville, and I did a uh, couple of very good saves. The truck was completely sideways, and I was able to save it, get it back on the wheel. That got my adrenaline running pretty fast, and then... Uh, <laughs> Well, I was able to do another nice wheelie where I walked it, my El Toro Loco all the way across the pile. So that's another thing that 
got me very excited, and the crowd really enjoy it, too. Hey, the next time you're in Omaha, I want you to do me a favor and, and kind of give me a lesson on how I can get my Ranger to do cookies like you do it. <laughs> all right, all I, right. I, I hope my Ford Ranger has enough horsepower, but uh, <laughs> maybe I could try that out. <laughs> Yeah, well, we can we can see it. Maybe we, should, we need some snow or something. I will help it out. It will be a lot easier. <laughs> hey, uh, and then so we're we're talking about the judging. I want to talk about the judging now because there's there's also competitions that you have to achieve, like races between two drivers where you're trying to get around the track at a certain amount of time. But there's also judging. So there's a little bit of nuance that goes to the judging as to where you got to kind of play to the judges a little bit, right? Totally. I mean, well, we got to impress the judges. Uh, Try to make eye contact with them. Uh, I mean, if the judge doesn't like you, you're not going to get a good score, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, but, yeah, you're pretty much right. We got seven different types of races with three vehicles. So throughout the whole night, we need each event is worth a certain amount of points, and we need to win as many points as possible because the driver who wins the most events throughout the season gets to go and play at the overall uh, at the main event in Las Vegas, Nevada for the World Finals. Oh, okay. I was, I was wondering how those points and those events came into tally for the World Finals. Yeah, that's. I mean, we're all every night we get points, so every 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 show has an overall winner. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the freestyle is worth two points, so that's pretty much where we can catch up to somebody if you were not winning as many races or ATV heats or uh, donut competitions, you know. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, whoever wins the most overall events throughout the season, uh, we they're going to pick one driver of the Am- uh, the Monster Jam Amstel Series from the East Coast and one from the West Coast. The two drivers that have won the most amount of events, they will go to Monster Jam World Finals and compete in the main event. Wow. And that's that's the big time. That's the Super Bowl, the World Series of Monster Jam, right? Exactly. That's as big as it gets. We have over 100 trucks in the pit party. There's over 40 trucks racing. Uh it's, just, it's three days of racing, one day of qualifying, one day of racing, one day of freestyle. So, oh. I, I mean, it's, it's just phenomenal. Something never seen before. Every year, there's something new. There's a surprise every single year out there. And that's uh, that's an event that goes on in Las Vegas. And it's something that, I, I and I'm sorry to say, but before I went to the Mid-America Center and watched you guys compete, I never really had in, interest in it. But now I'm kind of thinking, maybe I need to go to Vegas and watch this because that's the big time. I mean, the show at, at the Mid-America Center was cool, but there was a lot more and a lot bigger uh, 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 field for you guys to work in. Right, that's correct. I mean, uh, well, one thing I like to say is, uh, as all these athletes that we're racing in these tight arenas requires a lot of talent to be able to perform at the level of performance that we're putting out there. Yeah. Uh, cause the track is so technical that you gotta be on your toes, you know, ready for whatever's going to happen when you're on a stadium track. Well, you got more time to let the truck settle down line up for the next ramp and go big, big again, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was really impressed with, you know, Mid-America Center is a little bit of a small arena, but you guys were able to negotiate that uh, that arena pretty well with the one ramp with the different angles and different stuff like that. So kudos to you guys. I never would have been able to do it. Dan, it's a little bit different driving when, you're, when your rear tires turn, too. That's true. <laughs> right, that makes a big difference. I mean, if we didn't have that rear steering, we probably couldn't even make that turn inside those arenas. We talk a lot as a NASCAR fans and dirt track fans here on the front stretch about the exposure that our race car drivers have to fans and how easy it is to get exposure to these guys. Is it the same for fans that are going to come down this weekend uh, to Kansas City? Do they have easy access to you guys? Oh, for sure. I mean, we're going to have two peak parties, uh, one February 6th, uh, 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. Mm-hmm. So we're going to have a pit party, and then we have another one on February 7th. Uh, from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. again. And those big parties is where we allowed all the fans to come over and take pictures with all the athletes, uh, all the all the ATVs, speedsters, and Monster Jam trucks are going to be on the floor. You're going to be walking on the track. You can buy all the official merchandise from Monster Jam. So it's an opportunity for all the people to come over and get to meet all of, all, all of us, the athletes, you know? Yeah, that's really cool, man. I, I really do uh, appreciate you joining us this morning on the front stretch. We're going to let you go, get you uh, kind of rested up, and get you ready for Kansas City this weekend. Make sure you get your tickets at monsterjam.com. Mark List, driver of El Toro Loco. Thanks a lot for joining us, sir. Thank you very much, and, yeah, I really hope to see all these awesome fans from Kansas City come over and cheers up and uh, – Show some support for all of our athletes. And, well, Mark, if we hear of any open seats for the Daytona 500, we'll throw your name in the hat, okay? <laughs> awesome. I really appreciate that. I would like to be there. All right. Thanks, Mark. Have a good one. 
Thank you very much. Have a good one, too. All right, bye. Bye-bye. So, again, that was the uh, driver of El Toro Loco, and that means uh, the crazy bull in uh, in Spanish. So, uh, really cool guy. I was really impressed with that whole event. I, I, I'm i kind of ashamed to say I'd never been to one before, and I finally got talked into going, and I had an absolute ball. I couldn't believe, despite how freezing it was in there, because it was, a, it was a, you know, there was a little bit of complaint about how cold it was. They had to leave the doors open to the outside, and yeah. it was negative to five fumigate, outside. To fumigate the I would have much rather been cold. Cold than asphyxiated, so you know there's there's a kind of a trade off there. But I shivered. But I mean, when they had a good jump, they had the the Snooby Doo truck. You know, now that Mark's off the phone, she was my favorite. The Scooby Doo truck. She did awesome. I was really impressed with how good she did because you know it's it's a girl, so you kind of root for her against all the guys, and she's cute, and you know, yada, yada, and she did really well. And but uh, I I also enjoyed watching El Toro Loco and and Max D and and the NEA uh, police. It was really cool. And then of course Grave Digger, uh, the probably the biggest name on the circuit for the Monster Jams. Uh, if you want to go to this event, there are tickets still available. You can pick them up. Go to MonsterJam.com slash events easiest way to do is google it now if you buy them in advance they're just 10 bucks if you get them day of at the ticket window they're going to be 12 bucks and there's events uh this friday starting at 7 30 saturday they got two shows at 2 and 7 30 and then a sunday matinee at two o'clock it's the kansas city uh sprint center take the weekend go down and enjoy yourself the kids are going to have a ball and if you're a performance junkie it is kind of fun to watch these things because you can see exactly how much technology and everything there yeah. is that actually go into these trucks so you know at least go once you know expand your horizon like i said it's uh it's totally different but take some air protection because yeah. they are they're yeah. all blown and uh i think most of them run on alcohol so they are extremely loud oh yeah they i mean it was it was like I said, it was tickling my eardrums where I was right at that level where I might have. I'm, I think I'm a little bit more deaf today, but uh, yeah, it was. It was. And to your point with that, the uh, the way they could maneuver these trucks is just insane. I mean, ten to twelve thousand pounds. They've got four of those sixty six inch tires on them. It's just nuts how they can maneuver these trucks so seamlessly through the ramps and land it just right to where the truck acts a certain way. And it's a really cool event. It's it's much much more than going and watching them smash a bunch of cars there's well, a lot more to it now and like you said when you watch them do a backflip or something you know mm-hmm. you see all these motorcycle riders you know five six years ago the backflip was the new trick for them yeah but they're throwing around a little 250 or 300 pound motorcycle right. <laughs> and i was watching on fox sports a couple of a couple of weeks ago after that event at the mid america center they uh they were doing front flips in these things they'd specially rigged a ramp that kicked out so that the back of the truck would come around. And that was the new uh, trick they had figured out for the 2015 World Finals. And they said, just wait, we've got some really cool things in store for the 2016 World Finals, which um, I think I said that wrong. It was the World Finals that just happened a couple of... No, it, was, it happened last year. I think it's. I think the World Finals are in March or April or something like that. But, well, I would think they would be in the fall. Yeah, I'll have to double check on that. I didn't do enough research on that, but um, yeah. So tickets are available. There's also some um, uh, uh, ticket offers available. Uh, Casey's General Stores. You can pick up discount coupons up until this Thursday. You can pick up five dollars off. So get your tickets for half off. You can also pick up uh, buy one get one free ticket vouchers at Metro PCS locations in Kansas City. And then if you want to see Zombie, Zombie was one of them that I was really impressed. Because it had these two zombie hands that came out of the front of the truck. And so it was kind of cool when he would do his jumps. Like, it'd be, like, waving around like a zombie arm, you know? And then the announcer, whenever the zombie guy would come out to compete, the announcer would say, Oh, kids, get your zombie arms out. And all the kids would stick their arms out (laughs) like they were zombies. And it was really fun and interactive. So you can go and see Zombie February 4th at the Casey's General Store in Grain Valley, Missouri. It's going on from 2 to 6. That's this uh, this coming Thursday. Uh, A lot of really cool stuff going on for Monster Jam. Monsterjam.com for all tickets and information we got to take a break we'll come back and uh turn number three and four we're going to take on our kaziski auto parts legends of the dirt series quite the talker we had this weekend jim wilson's going to join us to talk about his career and his time as a um uh, in the dirt world so we'll talk to him coming up in turns three and four we'll be back here on the front stretch if you love wings if you love rings and all kinds of other tempting things Quaker Steak and Lube is the official watering hole for the front stretch and the best place to catch all the NASCAR action today. Open at 11 a.m. with delivery available to Council Bluffs. Great times, great food. Get to Quaker Steak and Lube. 
Are you looking to book your next outing? Look no further than Joe's Carding in Council Bluffs. Located just north of Bass Pro Shop, Joe's Carding can handle outings of well over 100 plus people. Bachelor parties, corporate outings, team building, birthday parties, and much more. Give Buddy a call today and reserve your outing. Joe's will even work with local restaurants to cater your event. Book yours today at joescarding.com. That's Carding with a K. It's time to get to Joe's and find out what everyone already knows. Feather the break and get back to the gas. Dan and Dirk are headed into turn three on the front stretch. Welcome back to the front stretch. We're heading heading into turn number three, and uh, it's time for the Kaziski Auto Parts Legends of the Dirt Series. We're talking with the man who dabbled a little bit in driving, but mostly found his success promoting and running a late model touring series and working for NASCAR. We're talking to the man who is going to be headed down to Adams County Speedway to take over the race director operations. Jim Wilson, how you doing this morning, Jim? I'm doing fine. We do appreciate you taking the time out of your day to have a little conversation with us as a part of the Kaziski Auto Parts Legends of the Dirt Series. So let's kick it off at the best place to kick it off, the beginning. 27 years of age, you made your way to Newton, Iowa to watch your first stock car race. Dirk and I were talking about it. We couldn't figure it out. Was that an asphalt or a uh, dirt race? No, it was a dirt race, but it was actually, it wasn't in Newton. It was in Stewart. Oh. Where my first race was. Okay, that makes more my, sense. My cousin had a... Uh, had an old claim stalker, mm-hmm. and what they called a claim stalker. They had a hundred dollar claim on the whole car, and he was racing at Stewart and uh, on uh, Saturday nights. And so I started going out there with him. But then they did. We did race at Newton on Sunday nights too. Oh, okay, okay. They well, had a they had a dirt track in Newton. A guy named Marion Robinson promoted okay. Newton. Just out of curiosity, do, do you know where that track is in relation to like Iowa Speedway now? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. I, it, it was, it was closer to town. It was, was it? It was just north of, north of the, well, the interstate wasn't even in then. Mm-hmm. So if you can imagine that, it was like well, north of Highway 6. So. <laughs> that was, that was a little <laughs> bit ago then. Yeah, yeah. So it was 19, uh, 1967. At that time you owned, you owned some, uh, quarter horses. You did some, uh, local rodeo work, uh, yeah, I around did. that area. I was, I was uh, I had moved up from Tarkio, Missouri, to Des Moines to take a job at the Chevrolet dealership there in Des Moines, the Bob Brown Chevrolet, and and I had quarter horses, and I'd I'd been showing quarter horses and and riding in in uh, rodeos and and uh, doing bulldogging and stuff like that. I was just a young guy. What, was it easy? Not to too give... many brains. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> was it easy to give up the horse the horsing aspect of it all? Uh, yeah, well, not, yeah, it was because I was really, where I lived, I didn't have a, where I had to move to up there, I didn't have a very good place to keep mm-hmm. my horses, and it was, it was really a hassle to, uh, to get to them and, and to work with them, and there was no place up there to, uh, uh, that I could find that I wanted to do what I'd been doing with them, so it wasn't that bad to give them up, I, and I had a guy that wanted to buy them, so, uh, so I sold them to him. I worked with horses about ten years ago, and I tell you, they're they're some of the most amazing creatures. They're they're absolutely majestic. They're so beautiful. They've got their own personalities, but the downside no, really, is is good God, can they really hit the wallet when they want to? <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. They they are, and I was really attached to one horse especially, and and uh, he was a registered quarter horse, and and. Uh, but uh, I I gave him up and, and then I started racing. So fast forward a little bit into the later days and more recent times. Did, did have you gotten back into horse racing now that ra- now that you're? Uh, oh no, 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 I haven't been. I haven't been uh, around horses since I since I sold all my gear and stuff. And <laughs> I haven't been. It's been forty years probably. Nice. So. That's too bad. Anyway, let's get back to dirt racing. Uh, so you went to this race at Stewart, Iowa, and you immediately got hooked, and you bought your own car and decided you were going to go racing. Yes, I did, and I drove it uh, some that year, and then uh, uh, that winter we built a, uh, a new car, uh, a super stock. What they, they called them super stocks back then. They, there wasn't such a thing as a late model. They, there were super stocks and claim stocks, and and uh, then we started racing at Oskaloosa and at Des Moines. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, we were at Oskaloosa like the second night out, and I had this kid, Joe Merrifield, that worked, helped me build the car, and he was just, 
I believe Joe was just about 18 and 17, 18 years old, and uh, he was going to school to be a plumber, and and uh, he was he was over there all the time helping me on the race car, and he went to the races with me. Anyway, he had driven he had driven a, a claim stalker at Stewartson, I guess it was, and it's hard to remember back. Anyway, he ended up getting in my my super stock and done pretty good in it, so I just left him and and he drove from me for me from then on. So that was in 68, I think it was. He started 69, somewhere in there, he started driving for me. Did, did you miss giving up the driving duties, or did you just feel like, I, th- I think my calling is going to be as a, as a builder and an owner? Yeah, that was, I no, I, I, I enjoyed driving, but yeah. I enjoyed, uh, I also enjoyed building it and watching it, watching what I had built run, you know. So mm-hmm. I think I probably might have enjoyed that more than sitting behind the wheel. It, the you know, I didn't I didn't feel like I needed the glory or anything of being a driver, so uh I just it, it I didn't really miss it, no. Yeah, that, that fame that comes with being a dirt driver and the guy standing in victory lane holding the checkered flag and getting the kiss from the flag girl or the or the trophy girl, that's a that's a pretty alluring thing. That's something that people really are drawn to and it takes right. a lot to step away and say, I think I think I'm gonna make more hay as a as an owner and a builder. Well and yeah, but some people aren't uh, aren't looking for that either i mean and i wasn't i wasn't looking for that fame or that that glory or i was just very satisfied when the car went out and hit on all eight cylinders and and (laughs) come back in one piece and and we'd finish good you know so that was that was my calling so Uh, that's what i did until pardon okay go ahead that's what you did until until uh and in 1974 75 we built a uh our first late model and uh, it was called a late model, and then uh, <clears throat> we had a tough year, but we we ended up we won the world 100 that year with it. Joe did, and and uh, that was that was quite an undertaking. But but uh, we won that, and then we won uh, we got second in a big race up in Michigan the next week, and uh, ended up on a on a you know a high note that year. So. Hey, take me back to uh, the night that you gained the nickname uh, Wire Wilson. Oh, we were at uh, Marshalltown <laughs> Speedway. Yeah. Okay, and we were running a car that a guy named Mike Noted built. He had uh, he. I was just working on the car. I didn't build the car, and I didn't own the car or anything. I was helping them out. And Don Hoffman was there, and I was there, and Don Hoffman had broke in a heat race. Well, they were running the feature, and the the body the body panel came was coming off of the car, and uh, the the rear quarter panel was was coming loose just from being on the racetrack. No rubbing or anything like that. No, it was just uh, the uh, the upper the roof was coming loose on the roof post on the rear, so <laughs> okay. it was moving back and forth. So it wasn't mounted well. Okay. So he pulled in, uh, we waved him in on a red flag. Back then you could do it. No, we went back then, you could go out on the racetrack and work on it. So we grabbed some wire, Hoffman and I did. And you remember Don Hoffman? Yep. And, uh, huh? Oh, I remember Don. Sure. Uh, so Don Hoffman and I, he had broke. He, him and I grabbed some wire and went out on the racetrack on the red flag. And we we tied that uh, roof post to the to one of the roll cage bars, wrapped around there good and tight. Well... What well, we didn't know that the guy that built the car had run the gas line up that rope, that, that <laughs> roof, that bar, that post. We didn't know it, and Joe took off. Nick, he went about a oh, hundred yards, and the car died. And he started, went about a hundred yards, and the car died. Finally, he pulled the pits, and and they found out what caused it. So they started. They called me Wire Wilson after that for a while. <laughs> that didn't stick very long, but that that's what that was all about. That's uh. what happened. So. Those uh, sometimes those little fixes can be the the, the difference between uh, uh, what what happened there, you know, not finishing that race, but yet uh, on the other corner that could be the easy fix and and winning yourself the race. Well, sure, it would have been an easy fix if he hadn't run the gas the rubber gas line up along the roller bars, you know. Yeah. Which today they couldn't they couldn't get by doing that anyway. They would nobody would let them, you know, but. Back then, there wasn't many rules. You just did what whatever took to get the car running. So, how many times has a roll of duct tape or a piece of baling wire saved you? Oh well, man, <laughs> I, it's it's unbelievable, yeah. unbelievable. It's it's yeah, it's uh, 
uh, you do what you have to do, especially with duct tape. Duct tape, was hundred mile, we used to call it 100 mile an hour tape. Yep, yep, yep. I, um, I, I got my lesson from duct tape every Saturday night on Iowa Public Television. Red Green would show me how to make full use of that thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, we used it all the time, so. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it's uh, that was what I, that was in Marshalltown. That was golly, I don't know when that was, and uh, I didn't have a car that year for some reason. But uh, my car was in the garage or something. But Joe was driving this other guy's car, and but uh, then uh, then we came. Joe retired and didn't race for me. And then from '76 till he drove for Moyer, and I think it was in. Uh, 81, we we built another car, and uh, I built another car, and Joe drove drove it. Take, take me back. It. You'd mentioned early on as we were getting started here in the interview that, that you had uh, taken that car to the uh, World 100 at Eldora, and and, and you, neither you or Joe had ever been to Eldora, but you guys ended up getting that win. Was that a surprise to walk in there on your first race and get that well, win? Well... You know, we didn't realize the magnitude of the of the uh, program over there, Eldor. We we had no idea they were. Their sang, Ed Sanger was going, Don Hoffman was going, Kurt Hansen and and Bill Swanzinger and Verlin Akers. All them guys were going to the World One Under. And those were guys we raced against every week. Mm-hmm. And so I said to Joe, "I want to go to the World One Hundred. And he said, "Oh, okay. You know, if you want to go, we'll go." He said, "We shouldn't go, but we, you know, we'll go." And so we went to Davenport. They had a race at Davenport on Friday night. <clears throat> and the way they did the World 100 back then, they qualified on Saturday and the race was on Sunday. Mm-hmm. And this was in 75. So we raced at Davenport Friday night and we finished ninth. And it, the car was just working terrible. Just absolutely couldn't. Just working terrible. Were you thinking about and, not going after that? Well, I no, I still had in my head I wanted to go. And if Joe had said I don't want to go, I couldn't have argued with him because... The car was working that bad, but he never said anything. We got in the truck, and we took off, and we went in a caravan. All of us traveled together. And uh, so we pulled into uh, Eldor Speedway, and I, I'm going to tell you, I was never so impressed in my life. <laughs> <laughs> you you walk up there to sign in. There was a line probably a block long to get signed in, and uh, we found this was Saturday about 10 o'clock in the morning, and they were going to start practicing i think at two o'clock in the afternoon or something like that so anyway we uh got up to sign in and they had uh believe this or not <clears throat> they had three uh those big uh metal uh trash cans sitting yep. there yep you put the they put the hundred dollar bills in one the fifty dollar bills in one the twenty dollar bills in another one jeez yeah, it was unbelievable, and those things were all about half full of money. <laughs> They're just wow. unreal. But uh, they had 210 cars show up that year, and we we time trial. What you did, you go out in time trial, and then you uh, come back in, and then you go back out again later in time trial. Well, we ended up with, uh, and then to, to run the race, they took the 24 fastest times. That's that's who got to run the race. Nobody else got to run the feature. Between the two time feet. trials, or was it you picked one, your – Oh, you t- you took your fastest time, okay. and and whoever the top twenty four in, in the final time trials got to run the the hundred lap race, and uh, so uh, we we ended up tenth in time. We had tenth fast time. Joe bounced her off the wall, coming off four to take the checker, but he got tenth fast time, and I mean he had her flat out, and uh, so. The when, next day, when he the came next, into the when he came into the pits after that time trial, did you guys know you had something for these guys? No, we didn't. We didn't know where we were. Nobody knew where we were at until it was over. Matter of <laughs> fact, what I start, let me back up a little bit. When we yeah. got signed in, we pulled down in the pits, and we held the tr- we held all the uh, car on an old. It was an old. Actually, it was a uh, one ton truck with a had an old converted casket hauling uh, flatbed on it. Oh, but, uh, uh, like and a hearse. Tr- no, it was like a at least all caskets on. It was it was flat on top of deck plating and had drawers down alongside for okay. they used to carry to dig graves and stuff. Well, that's what we hauled it on. <laughs> anyway, I jacked the car up right there on top of the hauler and I changed all four springs and all the shocks. Set the wedge with a uh, floor jack and, and backed it off the trailer and off the truck and 
and we never touched it the rest of the weekend, and we hit it just right on the money. Hmm. And uh, so, anyway, the next day they they said they were going to run the World 100, and the weather was looking pretty bad, so uh, they had to run the World 100. They run the World 100 first, and then they were going to run uh, uh, consolation races with all the cars that didn't make the World 100 to get them some some money, I guess. Okay. So anyway, we won. That's that's how we won the world one. We took the lead on the forty uh, seventh lap. We took the lead on the world one hundred. Uh, it's it's. At what point did you realize that we had a car that could beat these guys? Well, uh, lap one hundred. <laughs> tell me about lap forty seven when they took the lead. We lapped, we lapped everybody but Ed Sanger. Oh wow! We had lapped the field. Everybody but Ed Sanger, and on the track was really rough. On the ninety first lap, the hood. The hood pin started broke on the car. We had a big old Chevelle, and the back hood pins broke. And he'd go into the corner, and the left side of the hood would come up. Oh. And he'd come uh, come off the corner, and he'd go back down. No, he'd come off the corner, and the hood would come up. And he'd go back in the corner, and the hood would lay back down. And I was watching the flagman, and Joe's going down the back straightaway, and the, the hood came up, and the flagman had the black flag in his hand. Well, he went into three and four, and he... He the hood fell back down. Joe hit a hole and it bounced, and then the other two hood pins broke off and it landed on the racetrack. Oh! So he put the black flag back and brought the yellow flag out, and uh, you were that close. We were that close getting black flag, <laughs> but we still would have gotten second. Yeah, we'd have still gotten second if we'd have taken the hood off, and went back out because at the worst we'd have gotten second because Sanger was the only one on the lead lap with us. So. Uh, Anyway, we so we ran the last nine laps and won the race. Well, so that, uh, let's let's take a quick break. We'll let you get some water, kind of relax a little bit, and then we'll talk about your days as a promoter, uh, starting working with NASCAR, the WDRL, and uh, what you yeah. got coming up here at Adams County. Does that sound good? Sounds good. We'll be back right. here on the front stretch, presented by Joe's Carding on AM five ninety Omaha's ESPN Radio. We have all been there before. Broken car part in your hand and some snot-nosed punk behind the counter has no idea what he is talking about, but he guarantees that this part will fix your car. You pay an arm and a leg for the replacement, get it home, and sure enough, it doesn't fit your car. Now, learn from your mistake and give an experienced salesperson at Kosiski Auto Parts a call today at 402-731-4592. Kosiski Auto Parts will get you back on the road with your arms and legs still attached. Joe's Carding in Council Bluffs has taken a page out of IMCA's rulebook and gone crate. These brand new low emission engines will still have you white knuckling it all through the Metro's fastest indoor facility. Joe's Carding is now friendly for all skill levels with their brand new Honda powered engines. It's time to get to Joe's today and find out what drivers like Jack Dover, Shaley Bate, and Andrew Kosiski have known for years. Located in Council Bluffs and online at joescarding.com. That's Carding with a K. It's checkers or wreckers as we enter turn four on the front stretch. Presented by Joe's Carding and Council Bluffs. Welcome back to the front stretch. Just about ready to wrap this baby up. We're continuing our conversation with Jim Wilson as a part of the Kaziski Auto Parts Legends of the Dirt Series. Jim, we've talked about you winning the World 100, talked about you getting into a stock car. Let's kind of transition a little bit into your times with uh, NASCAR. At what point did you stop being an owner and a promoter and you started working with NASCAR as a part of the Bush All-Star Series? Well, I owned a car in 1981, and... uh, uh, Joe drove for me, and it was just racing was just getting so out of hand. It was oh, you, you could obsolete a car in, in six weeks. I mean, they were just changing. And then uh, Gary Oliver over there, Tri City Buggy, came out with a 1,400 pound late model car. You guys probably never heard about it, but it was it was just it was just unreal what was happening. And so I got together with. Uh, uh, Keith Simmons, who owned Tom Hurst's car at that time, and I got talking one day over at Cedar Rapids. That was when it was dirt. And I said, I can't afford to win anymore. And he said, I, we were running <laughs> first and second every week over at Cedar Rapids. And and uh, so I said, I can't afford to win anymore. And he said, I can't either. Because every time you'd run a – if you run a 25-lap race, you'd go through four tires at least. And that was, you know, that was $500. Wow. So uh, – I said, well, I'm going to do something about it. And he said, well, whatever you need me to do, let me know. So we got talking. So I I decided we needed to 
do something about the rules. And, and uh, I talked to Keith Kanak, who owned the Hawkeye Racing News, as you probably know. And and I said, I want to have a meeting with car owners and drivers and try to uh, come with some decent rules that we can afford to run by. Because nobody was ever, the promoters were all afraid to make rules. So uh, he said, well, you tell me what you want to do, and I'll put you an ad in the Hawkeye. So I said, just put in the Hawk ad anybody that is interested in saving late model racing, be it the uh, Amana colonies in, over in Amana, you know, on Interstate 80. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was on a Sunday, and I can't remember the date and time, but anyway, so he, he said he put a half-page ad in the Hawkeye and said just that. Anybody interested in saving late model <laughs> racing, be there. So we rented a room that held like 125, 130 people. We had 350 people show up at that wow. meeting. Wow. Yeah, it was, was unreal. So there was a lot of people that wanted to work on saving oh, yeah. racing. Oh, yeah, and a lot of them were promoters. Huh. Al Frieden was there. uh a lot of the promoters in eastern Iowa and central Iowa were there because they, they were all in trouble for car count and so on. Guys were calling for more money, and there wasn't any more money to be had. You know, it just it was just a terrible time. So anyway, we formed an association called the Midwest Racing Association, MWRA. And uh, uh, I was the president of it, and uh, we, uh, we formed uh, uh, some uh, – oh, we came up with some rules, and uh, some of the promoters said, "You, Al Frieden had three racetracks. He had Cedar Rapids, uh, West Liberty, and uh, uh, De- or Davenport at the time. Okay. And he said, if you come with a good set of rules, I'll adopt them at my racetracks. Well, that kind of got the ball rolling. They gave us three places to run Friday, Saturday, and Sunday if we, you know, with some rules. So we came out with some good rules. We had some put some committees together, and <clears throat> came out with some good rules, and, and uh, that's how that started, and it's, it was working very well. Well, then I kind of quit racing so much and went around and, and, and helped the tracks enforce the rules. And uh, we had a good tire rule, and we went with a 390 carburetor, just some things like put a weight rule on the cars and, and things, just basic rules. And uh, so that was working well. That, one, that was in, fall, in the winter of 81 and 82, 81. And we ran a year that way, and uh, well, then in uh, January of 1982, uh, Jim Hunter from NASCAR called me from Daytona Beach. I was out in my garage working, and he called me just off out of the blue, and he said, "Are you coming down to uh, Daytona for Speed Weeks?" And I said, "Well, I no, I wasn't planning on it." He said, "Well, if you want to come down and sit down and meet with me," he said, oh, "We'll pay your way." We'll pay your expenses. So I did. I got a plane ticket and went to Daytona and went to the NASCAR office to sit down, and, and uh, that's how I started working for NASCAR. And uh, they hired me and uh, hired me on a, a just a sublet labor deal to start off with, you know, yeah. to see how I was going to work. And and uh, I worked, and then in uh, 82, I started with them, and then uh, I went full-time by the end of the year, and because I, I couldn't do that and run my shop both, I sold all my racing stuff and, and went full-time with NASCAR. And how, then in 80, 85, we started the Bush All-Star Tour. How did you end up on Jim Wilson's radar? Did you ever find out how he came across you? Jim Hunter. I'm sorry, radar. Jim Hunter. Jim Hunter. I'm talking to uh, Jim Wilson. I'm <laughs> you know, I don't. I don't know. The, one of the promoters, I guess Al Freed. Oh, I know the three tracks that Al Frieden had were NASCAR sanctioned racetracks. Okay. And Hunter told me, he said, I don't normally work with Drivers Owners Association. NASCAR doesn't normally work with Drivers Owners Association. But he said, everything we hear about what's going on with your association is is all positive. Did- and he said, I'd like to talk to you. So that's what. That, but he evidently Frieden told him that I was. Uh, uh, Head of the same WRA. Was it pretty much a no-brainer for you to switch over to NASCAR, or, or were you kind of drawn to to stick around and help out the MWRA for a little while? Well, no, we. Uh, uh, yeah, I was pretty well drawn to go to NASCAR because there wasn't any funds in the MWRA. When I traveled, <laughs> I did it out of my own pocket. You know. <laughs> yeah. And, so, and uh, sometimes, NAS- as much as you want to stick around, you got to go where the money is. Right, and uh, so well, when we when when uh, I went to work for NASCAR, the MWRA just kind of died. It went away. 
it it went away. But we had at one time, we had 11 racetracks. We had tracks from Grand Island, Nebraska, to Peoria, Illinois, to Alexander, uh, Minnesota, to Jefferson City, Missouri, all on the same rules. These were all NASCAR tracks. God, that is unheard of. Yeah, they were all on identical rules. All and you had there was eleven racetracks in the Midwest that these guys would go to and unload their car and never change a boulder and nut and go racing. Well, so, so, so Jim, let, let me kind of interrupt here and, and ask you this: Why can't we have that today? I mean, I, I, I from when I got into this sport five years ago, I, I kept looking at it and going, as a driver, I got to keep changing my car up if I want to go race at a different track on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and a Monday. You know, it's it, why can't we have that today? Because now all the well, promoters think they got the best idea. <laughs> yeah, it and that's and a promoter a guy will tell a promoter, well, if you'll change your rule and do this and do that, I'll come race for you. Well, and that that's kind of what happens. Uh, you need the sanctioning body, and that and that's NASCAR. See, and that that's a long story, and I won't tell it. But uh, they wouldn't let me keep doing that. Uh, I did that for for three or four years. I'd have meetings with the promoters, and we'd go into we'd go into meeting, and we'd get into some heated heated arguments <laughs> over rules and stuff. But when we come out of that meeting, we were all on identical rules. Well, and uh, so, uh, uh, but NASCAR made me quit doing that. Yeah, I mean that when NASCAR came in and centralized all those rules there, and I, I'm like I'm thinking it was about '83. Of course, I was basically only yeah. going to Sunset every week. Um, and Sunset was one of the tracks that was on the same rules. And, yep. And I, it basically saved the late model class. I mean. It really did. It really did. It, it was. They, all, car counts started going up. Crowds were going up. And, uh, yeah, you could talk to Craig Kelly about that. He he was very unhappy when they, when the rules got split up. They, uh, you know, they, they were one of the tracks that really liked it when the rules were the same everywhere. Yeah, I mean, and, and I mean, we had probably out of out of the tracks that you were dealing with. I mean, I know we were still getting 50, 50 cars a night out there. You yeah, know? I know. What that is. And and I'm still saying it saved the class because it would have. It I think it would have disappeared by by 1990. I don't think there would have been any more late model racing around this. I area. don't think so either. Well, hmm. then then NASCAR came out with a, a deal that right after we got all on the same rules, we our, our uh, national program and and regional program. Because, see, these tracks were all in the central region. They were all in one region. And so the guys were fighting for that championship. So uh, then NASCAR came out with a deal of the best 30 finishes uh, to become the national champion. Well, guy, if it rained out in Dubuque at noon, uh, them guys would head for Omaha for sunset to raid uh, Roger Dolan and Fish line and all them guys, they'd go to Omaha to race. Because you didn't have to change your car. It was, it was didn't all, have to change anything. the rules they, were all the same. They could get there in time to race, they could unload it and race, you know. And uh, it was just tremendous for the promoter. And, and it was vice versa. If Omaha rained out at noon, and some of them, Gaziskis and them guys, <coughs> they'd head for Eastern Iowa. So, <coughs> so it was a win win for, ever, for the promoters. But it was expensive. The, the program, the way NASCAR had laid out, was expensive for the racers because there was a lot of traveling. Yeah. Well, when they went to that th that best 30 finishes, I mean, that was better than what they had before. Like when Hurst won the first year, I remember reading an article where he'd raced in Colorado and everywhere yeah, else. Yeah, he, he traveled all over the country to race. I remember that very well. <coughs> so take yeah, me. Yeah, that could have bankrupted this car owner. <laughs> <laughs> so take us through. Uh, you, you've now started working for NASCAR. It's been a couple of years. Did did you help create the Bush All Star Series? I created the Bush All Star too. I went okay. into Hunter in 1985, and I said I want to start a touring series. And uh, he said, "Well, what do you want to do?" And I said, "Well, I said we want a place where we can take I can take these guys and they can put them all together. Their promoters can." hit a home run or, you know, make a little extra money and and call it the uh, Bush All-Star or call it the All-Star Series or whatever you want to call it. Well, they came with a sponsor for Bush. Hunter was all for it, and uh, uh, he was, they came with a sponsor for Manheiser Bush, and we called it the Bush All-Star Series. So I ran that for – I ran it by myself for the first couple of years, and uh, I think the second year, late <coughs> year, I hired John Darby to work huh. for me as, as a tech man. I remember teching, uh, doing the Miller 100 in Cedar Rapids one year, an all, a Bush All-Star Series race, and it was we had 67 late models, and, and I run the whole show. I, I, I teched them all by myself. 
Wow. And uh, so it was later in the year, John Darby started working for me, and then John worked for me for a couple of years on the series, and then they moved him into a, a little higher position. They moved him in as a, a regional series uh, guy, you know, the, kind of a troubleshooter, I guess. And uh, I hired some other people. But anyway, I had a full crew toward the end, but we did the Bush All-Star Series for 17 years. And, uh, and then in 2001, why uh, NASCAR uh, decided that uh, they did away with There were several reasons, but I think I still think one of the main reasons it was done away with was because of the uh, uh, three deaths that we had in NASCAR that year, and they were going to have to go with some stricter rules, safety rules, to... Uh, uh, you know, put on the cars, the Hans devices, and and pit crews in in driver suits and helmets and so on. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, uh, they what? didn't feel that wouldn't have worked on dirt. And so they, when they when they uh, the sanctioning body felt like they needed everything under the same blanket and uh, all their divisions under the same blanket. <laughs> and, they, and my series was the only one they couldn't put under that blanket. So. They didn't have much choice but to do away with it. So, so you, they canceled you, it, and I had uh, I had several guys come up to me and want me to start my own series and keep it going, keep it going, and so on. That's when I, I resigned. Then, in uh, at the end of December of 2001, and started uh, my wife and I started the uh, uh, World Dirt Racing League. The WDL became uh, WDRL. Became the WDRL. WDRL. That's right. Um, how many years did that run for? We ran it for eight years, uh, 2002 through 2010. Okay. And then uh, we it just the traveling got to be so much, and it was, it was, it was getting, it was getting hard to get races because there was, there was other series. Our purses were like twenty three thousand dollars. We paid five thousand to win of all of our to win all of our races, and uh, four hundred to start. And uh, but there was other series that come in there that was. Uh, Paying like twenty five hundred to win, and and uh, the <coughs> our guys would go race for those series. The guys were running for us, so and they had a, like a sixteen, fifteen, sixteen thousand dollar purse. So the promoters, you know, said, "Why should I book a WDRL race when I can book this other series for ten thousand dollars less or eight thousand dollars less and get the same cars?" Yeah. Now they weren't getting as many cars because we averaged over forty four cars for that eight years. So. Wow. Uh, but, uh, you know, that was, uh, they were, so they, they, I kind of hurt. It was getting harder to get races and, and I, I lost my title sponsor. Uh, Polly Dome was our title sponsor and we lost him. And then we were getting at an age, we decided we were just going to, uh, hang it up. And so we sold it or we got out, we just closed it up. And then we, we came to Bethany, Missouri and, and leased a racetrack down here was going and opened it. Hmm. And that's I what did. you've been doing for the last couple of years? No, 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 no. That, we had <laughs> 11 rainouts in 13 weeks, and we shut it oh, down. Oh, gosh. So I didn't go to a race for five years until uh, last year. Uh, Dennis, who I worked for at one time at NASCAR, he, he used to be at NASCAR. You, if you guys ever heard of him or not. But, yeah, I knew Dennis. Yeah, Dennis, uh, he got involved with a series uh, uh, that Circle Track Magazine was sponsoring, and, and he called me a year ago in October and wanted to know if I'd be the race director for that. It's called the Great American Racing Series, GARS. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. And so uh, we went to Indiana and Tennessee and, uh, you know, down down in that part of the world, Kentucky, and they only ended up having four races this year. We were supposed to have six, but they ended up only having four. We lost two of them. And uh, so uh, I was a race director for that this year. And uh, then uh, they just it wasn't working out, so they they shut it down. It's not going to run again. Mm. And then you got the call from Adams County Speedway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they uh, well, I called. I'd been talking to Louie and, and a little bit, and, and uh, I found out they were looking for somebody. So I, he asked me if I'd come up and talk to him. So I went up and sat down and talked to him, and they hired me to uh, do the, be the race director, which I'm pretty excited about. It. Well, I mean, w- with all of your experience, we could definitely use you in this area. You know the area, you know the series, you know the the, the, the landscape, and it's a NASCAR sanctioned track, so yeah. it feels like it's a good fit for you. 
Well, I think it is. I think it's going to be a good fit. And the fair board seems to be there. They're, they're great people. They're great to work with. What I'm really excited about, everybody, I've been, I went to the fair board meeting. I had a couple of meetings I've been to, and every one of them guys are uh, wanting to make this thing work. Everybody's thinking positive and thinking they want to make it a, a success. You know, well, there's nobody in there for the, they're not in there. There's no greed there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And uh, they seem to, whatever it takes to make this work, and they're just, they're just a great bunch of guys. They they kind of they got it together pretty well. They've got committees for everything, and and uh, so and I've got just one contact that I'm that I work with mostly, and, and so I'm pretty excited about. It. I think it's going to be a real real nice thing. We got to, my wife and I got to go to Charlotte to the NASCAR banquet uh, for Corning this year this December, and that was that was pretty nice. So yeah, you know so. But, um... Are you are you kind of tentatively thinking about making some changes, or are you going to leave 2016 like 2015 and kind of see well, how things roll? Well, I told Louie and I told the fair board, I told the fair board, I'm, I don't want to come in there and reinvent the wheel. Right. Uh, the only thing I, I wanted to do, I wanted to go through their rules and, and uh, uh, not change anything, but reword and put them in a little better order. They weren't in very good order. It was like... Like reading a book was all one paragraph, you know. <laughs> so, so I I alphabetized the rules and 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 put put them in important departments and and uh, you know I've been working on some of that stuff. But that was but as far as changes, no, I don't I don't want to go in because I don't know what the, I haven't been to a race there. Yeah. So I yeah you know, sure I'm not going to go in there and, and uh, re- try to reinvent the wheel and and I'll be working with Joe Gazisky. Uh, their late model rules are pretty much the same as what i-80s are so uh and i'll be working with joe and them out there at i-80 to to uh on the late model rules and stuff so well, good. i yeah. think it'll work out i think it'll work out pretty good i talked to joe a little bit at uh banquet and and i want to get with him again and and sit down with him and and uh go over some other things but i think it's going to work out good we're really i'm really excited about it so adams county is staying with the nascar sanction aren't they Yes, sir. Yeah, they're staying with the NASCAR sanction there. Yeah, uh, and... as far as I know, they signed the contract, and and it's all it's all a go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's there was no talk about doing away with it the last meeting I was at, anyway. So we just got word that Junction Motor Speedway is going to IMCA, so I eighty is going to be the only NASCAR track in Nebraska, and then Corning will be the only other one in the area. I'll be nice. So, Junction Motor Speedway went to IMCA. Uh, yes, sir. Yep. I, I hadn't heard that yet. Uh, when did that happen? When yeah, this they just announced it yesterday morning on Facebook. Oh, boy. That's too bad. Yeah. Well, yep. that'll hurt. That'll yep. hurt I 80 a little bit. What night do they run a junction? Saturday. 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 Okay, well, is Harlan going to open up? Do you know? Have you heard anything there? Uh, I heard they didn't have a promoter the last I heard. That's the th- last thing I know that I've heard is the promoter wasn't, uh, he had some health issues, and they said, you either need to back off a little bit or, you we'll know, we'll bury you it. early. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, well, I don't know. So, But I think we'll do all right at Corning. Corning's always done a, kind of been on an island. They've worked with Sunset when Sunset was going, and they worked with I 80, and uh, they've done so very well. But, uh, most of their cars are, or a lot of their late models are guys that just run there on Saturday night and don't run anywhere else, you yeah. know? Yeah. And, uh, so we're going to have a lot of fun. It's, that's, that's going to be the number one thing as, as everybody needs to have fun. That's what it's all about. If you don't have fun, there's no use racing. And in the Amen. history of Adams County Speedway with just losing Gail Hampel, that's a man I always associated with that Speedway. That was a oh, bad deal. Oh, man, I'll tell you what, I, 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 see, and this, this is one thing, and one reason I decided to do this. Uh, Adams County Speedway is a very special place to me. It was, it was the first NASCAR track that I signed on when I when I went to work for NASCAR, and it was the first racetrack that we ran a Bush All Star Tour race on, and it was the racetrack where we ran our 200th Bush All Star Tour race on. So I mean, it's uh, I go back a long ways with the Hamples and with Adams County Speedway, and and and, and I knew Gail and John before I worked for NASCAR. John brought his uh, first late model off me. Hmm? He yeah. run the uh, yeah you know, I built his first late model. So hmm. uh, back when I was building cars in eighty and eighty one. So so I've known Gail and John a long time, and they're very special people. So and I'm yeah I'm really. Really sad to hear see Gail go, but 
I was sad to see Karen go too. So, yeah. are uh, are you going to be bossing your sister again then? Well, I don't. I think she's going to work there. I don't know. I probably <laughs> you don't boss people. <laughs> you know better than that. <laughs> uh, Jim Wilson, uh, the feature for this weekend's Kaziski Auto Parts Legends of the Dirt Series. Jim, uh, best of luck to you this year at Adams County and, and all your efforts over the next couple of years to help uh, continue dirt racing and, and spread NASCAR throughout the Midwest. All right, well, thank you guys, and, and we'll see you down the road. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll let you get your feet on the ground down there, and we'll swing down some Saturday night. Good. I'll be there. All, All right. right. Thanks, Jim. Have a good have a good one. You too. Thank you. Thanks, Bye-bye. Jim. All right, so if you happen to miss any part of that interview with Jim Wilson, you can head over to the YouTube page at about 10 a.m. this morning. Search Front Stretch Jim Wilson, and we will post it on the YouTube. Again, that'll be scheduled for about 10 a.m. this morning. And if any of you have over the last couple of years, because I know they've been through a lot of changes at Adams County and have quit going to races there for one reason or another, go give Jim a chance because he'll straighten that track out. You know, it kind of sounds like we were talking a couple of weeks ago when we, when we talked on the Front Stretch. I think it was actually – uh, the January third episode when, when we made when we talked about uh, Junction Motor Speedway switching to uh, to, to IMCA sanctioning that, that we really need somebody to come in and kind of help unify you know NASCAR's great for the drivers uh, insurance wise contingency awards payouts are a little bit better but uh, it, it's kind of getting to be NASCAR's just kind of on these islands as Jim just kind of talked about there so maybe Jim can come in kind of unify some rules between I-80 and Adams County and then help bring on some other tracks that are struggling with IMCA well he's got 30 plus years in the administrative side of things and uh, you know that's a ton of experience so it's definitely not going to hurt We'll be back next weekend to talk about the Sprint Unlimited. Boy, doesn't that sound good? The Sprint (laughs) Unlimited is coming up in just a little over a week. We'll preview that. We'll talk about some off-season changes as far as NASCAR is concerned. We'll talk about some off-season changes for the local dirt racing and get you set for the 2016 season in dirt racing that is to be. A lot to go here in uh, the next couple of weeks over the front stretch. And we do appreciate you joining us this Sunday morning. For Dirk Houston, I am Dan Taylor. Thank you so much for joining us have a great sunday we'll see you next sunday this is the front stretch on am 590 omaha's espn radio if you love wings if you love rings and all kinds of other tempting things great times great food get to quaker steak and lube quaker steak and lube is the official watering hole for the front stretch and the best place to catch all the nascar action today open at 11 a.m with delivery available to council bluffs Are you looking to book your next outing? Look no further than Joe's Carding in Council Bluffs. Located just north of Bass Pro Shop, Joe's Carding can handle outings of well over 100 plus people. Bachelor parties, corporate outings, team building, birthday parties, and much more. Give Buddy a call today and reserve your outing. Joe's will even work with local restaurants to cater your event. Book yours today at joescarding.com. That's Carding with a K. It's time to get to Joe's and find out what everyone already knows.